Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Remote No Pressure Podcast. I'm so glad that you decided to join us this week for another episode. This episode will not let you down. We have the Communications Director for the American Fly Fishing Trade Association, Mr. Matt Smythe, with us, who shares with us all kinds of crazy stories. He talks a little bit about his movie, A Deliberate Life. And I just want to say a um, big thanks out to Brian Kosminski up at True North Trout for making the introduction. You guys will not be disappointed. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited to have Matt Smythe with us. Thank you very much for hanging out with us, Matt. Uh, glad to glad to be invited. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days? Well, right now I'm um, I am the communications director for the American uh, Fly Fishing Trade Association out of Bozeman, Montana. I uh, I work remotely from New York and uh, handle all member communications and social media and different things like that for them. And uh, I still have uh, my hand in the freelance writing world as well on the marketing side. Um, do work for different clients, advertising agencies, some some direct clients and what have you. And, uh, and then I also am still every now and again, fortunately getting something placed in a magazine here or there. Fly Fish Journal or Drake stuff like that. So, well, that's great. Yeah, we've had some other uh, Drake artists. We had Paul Puck, or you know, uh, writers. We had Paul Puckett on. We've had Dave Karzinski. Um, so we've had a few of the Drake alumni here on on uh, yeah. on here. So, um, how long have you been writing? I mean, is that something that just kind of came natural to you, or was there a process? How did how did you end up writing for the Drake? Oh man. Well, let me see. Well, for the Drake, I, I think it, I, I just sort of, I, I actually, I, I started, I started writing and getting stuff published in like university journals. Uh, I have a master's in poetry. And uh, so I was doing a lot of writing even before getting into um, the fly fishing industry. Um and we, or even before being really being introduced, I mean, you know, the publications and stuff. So I'd been getting into different university presses and stuff like that with individual poems. And, um, and then as I got into fly fishing and I started reading more and I got turned on to, you know, the Drake and fly fish journal and some others, I, <clears throat> I realized, well, I can get some stuff. I can try publishing, you know, some stuff there. So, um, I, I think that I'm trying to remember back. I think the first, first piece for the Drake, I believe was, um, I think it was about pike fishing up on the St. Lawrence. I mean, it wasn't even poetry. It was just a story about, um, fishing up there with a friend of mine. And, uh, it, it, the the story writing and getting into you know figuring out how to get into magazines sort of it came out of doing some blog writing uh, that I was doing at the time too uh, for the the blog fishing poet um, yeah. I started that in 2009 and uh, wound up building an audience which was just fascinating to me because I started I started writing it to in a chronicle my time outdoors with my kids, you know, and so that I could, I could let them know what it meant to me and how I remembered it and different things like that. So when they're old enough to read it, that then, uh, uh, they could sort of fess up their, their take on that time and you know, what they remembered and be like, Oh, well, dad thought about it like this, you know? <laughs> so, so the stories just kind of, they, they came together and some of them, lived on the blog and others I you know I thought well hey this could be this could you know maybe go in the magazine and so I just sort of sent some stuff over the transom and was fortunate to get a few pieces here and there so not not regularly necessarily but there again I'm not writing <laughs> as regularly as I I was so what do you think it is and I've asked this question before I mean we've had some unbelievable artists on our on our uh, podcast, you know, and, and I've always, I always kind of ask the same questions. Why do you think, I mean, 
look, there's there's the Bass there's the Bass Pro like tour, you know, the B A S S tour and all these other things. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, what the the art and style of writing with fly fishing, fly fishing just attracts brilliant authors, um, and it also attracts unbelievable art. What do you think it is about fly fishing that attracts such great art and inspires you to write poetry? I think there's, I think there's a, a higher level of thoughtfulness um, that's inherent with the sport. Um, for me, I mean, I grew up casting spinner baits and Rapalas or actually Rapalas, I believe. This is how they're supposed to be pronounced. Of state New York, we call them Rapala. So, <laughs> at any rate, we. But uh, I grew up chasing bass and pickerel and and all that good stuff. And it wasn't until I learned how to fly fish that I really started to pay. I became a much, much more cognizant and much, um, I think, more more intelligent angler, <clears throat> more um, attentive. Angle, angler and um i think it has everything to do with really paying attention to details you know you have to you do have to be plugged in um at every point and 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 when you're out everything from your cast and making sure that you've got enough space you know for a back cast if, or not um all the way to how the fly is presented and the drift and paying attention to you know, air temperature and sunlight and water temperature and reading the water and everything else. And it's, it's not that those things are, um, they're in fly fishing and fly fishing only. I mean, you, in, with conventional tackle, you still have to make a cast. You still have to pay attention to water temperature and where the fish are holding and daylight time of year, the whole shooting match. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's a level you, it, you slow down more and you tend to, I think you have the opportunity to also be able to pick your head up and appreciate where you're at a little bit more. Um, so for me, it played, it played perfectly with my, with my writing because from a poetry standpoint, I mean, that's what it's about. It's, um, it's economy of words and it's being present. It's looking at things and putting things on paper in a, using the same words that everybody else has in their, you know, their lexicon, right? Everybody, there's no original words, just like there's no original thoughts necessarily or ideas. It's just how you package them and, and going for that simplicity and, and just being able to tell it in a way that when people read it, they think there is no other way that this could have been said, you know? Um, just like when you make that cast and that, you know, that the fish comes up and gently sits that drive by, there's just no other way that that fish would have, you know, actually come to, come to my hand. So, um, I think it's definitely, it's the same with, with artists as well. I think there's a heightened level of, of attention and awareness and, uh, really, you, you tend to have a little bit more of a sort of a critical focus as well. You know, um, you know, when something is working and something is not, um, you, you tend to tend to accept when it's not and move into something else that might <laughs> a little bit more, more quickly. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I don't think anyone's ever really brought that up, you know, because being an artist, you really do have to kind of pay attention to detail and processes and pull those things out and communicate those. Just like with fly fishing, you really have to kind of see beyond the water, you know, see that. I don't know how to say it. That's almost a spiritual vision, you know, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, aligned. well, and you're, I mean, you you have to be able to, to speak the fish's language, too. And, and in some ways, in many ways, I mean, with our tackle, right? in a far more lightweight, far more intimate way. You know, it's not it's not necessarily all gigantic flies and everything else. It's there's there's that component for sure, but mm-hmm. to be able to get right down to the, you know, 
larva and and you know nymphs and all the different st- life cycle stages of our you know the bugs and everything and be able to be able to speak to the fish and interact with the fish on each of those levels that's that to me is like holy smokes you can't, you can't get much more into the details than you know than that so mm. it is it is speaking a, a different language i've always been fascinated with the ability you know folks that really have a knack um to communicate with with wildlife or you know with even you know with fish and different things like goose hunters and deer hunters elk hunters you know the ones that are fantastic at at calling and things like that i just i i love it because you're i mean you are speaking another language you're you are you are interacting with them in a way that most 99 percent of humans on the planet they just don't do they don't know how you know and i think fly fishing is is very much like that you're dialed into a point you know we're not we're speaking in a, in a different in a different way to them but it's i don't know waxing a little philosophically here <laughs> yeah that's good though that's that's what we like you know i mean it, i mean i can we can go into detail on the best fly and the hatch and all that but that's there's plenty of other great podcasts for that we really like getting more into the philosophical side of things and and knowing why you do what you do. Now, if we take a step back, I mean, what what was your undergrad in? Was it in chemistry? Uh, it was in uh, biochem and forensics. Actually, I had a little bit of genetics mixed in there as well. So, but, but before you became a poet, can you tell us a little bit about your experience there at, at is it Genesee Hospital or Hennessy? It's Genesee, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Genesee uh, Hospital. Genesee, yeah, Gen- Genesee Hospital. Um, yeah, after oh man, after I got out of the service, I went to finish my associate's degree, and then moved through a couple of a couple of majors there, and then went to Texas State and maintained um, biochem and forensics major. But I didn't I didn't like going to class because it was fantastic weather, and there's a natural spring fed river that ran through campus that I would <laughs> much rather be at. <laughs> So I wound up moving back to New York and I, I went to a state school back in New York because I knew the weather would keep me indoors more during the winter and therefore in class. So I came back and I actually got a job. I, a friend of mine who was working in orthopedics, he knew that I was interested in going into forensic investigation. And so he said, hey, they're actually hiring. The pathology department is hiring per diem to do autopsies. <laughs> no way. He says, "Yeah, they'll pay. They'll pay a hundred dollars a post, but meaning um, post mortem, and they'll pay for parking as well." And I was like, oh, "That's brilliant!" So <laughs> I went in, and the the woman, uh, the woman who's the the head of the pathology uh, lab, she hand she I walked in completely cold and said, "Hey, I understand that you've got." a position open for uh to work in the morgue as a deaner and uh she said she kind of looked at me with her head cocked and said yes we do <laughs> and you know one one of my interests and all that other good stuff so she she said here she handed me a, a three ring notebook and said why don't you leaf through this take a look at this and then and i'll be back in about 15 20 minutes and it was the manual for autopsy procedure, uh-huh. but the I think she was hoping that it was gonna like scare me off. Right, right. But <laughs> but, but I actually I it wasn't even it 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 wasn't even like gruesome. It was it was hand hand drawn illustrations, and there it wasn't even as graphic as your normal biology or anatomy and physiology book. So it was. I, I kind of casually leaf through it and okay, so that's what a scalpel looks like when somebody draws it by hand. <laughs> this is what a body looks like when the chest is open, when somebody draws it by hand. And, but yeah, I spent a year doing autopsies. I, I have 56 um, that I've done and also 11, 11 brains that I've 
removed from folks's cranium and put into formalin so that pathologists could take a look at at their brains after they've they fixed and burdened up a bit more. So, what was the worst job you ever had? Oh, the worst job. Worst job I ever had. Man, I think I'm, I have to go back to uh, working at Burger King <laughs> when I I had graduated. Um, I graduated high school and I'd already gone to basic training and the first day of basic training was the first year of desert shield, uh, August 3rd, 1990. And then I graduated from basic training, came back to the reserve unit in my hometown and had picked up a part-time gig at Burger King while I was going to school, the college for a semester and I was bored stiff and I hated it. And I was sitting in the, sitting in the back hallway on an empty five gallon bucket that normally holds hamburger patties when it's full frozen <laughs> hamburger patty. And, uh, I was watching a black and white TV. It was plugged in and it was actually coverage of when the war kicked off. Wow. Uh, in, in, uh, 91. And, uh, I, Essentially, I I was miserable enough there. I, I pretty much turned in my apron and everything. I walked back out and I re-enlisted to go active duty. And then went uh, from there, went back to to ordinate school, Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, and then went to Germany uh, and ran ammo to and from, to and from the Middle East. Wow. From Germany. So, yeah. Now you did all this and then you were, you were, studying chemistry and whatnot um at what point were you did you decide i want to go for my master's degree in poetry well I, first of all i didn't i didn't i didn't graduate my undergrad i didn't graduate with a a chemistry or biochem degree at all i actually i changed majors um a a i think a sixth and final time uh, I changed the spring, spring semester of my senior year, my graduating semester. Three weeks in, I was sitting in a, a, a basement classroom and had very small sort of prison-like windows <laughs> up above because we were below ground. And it was a, it was a, uh, I, I believe it was a recombinant RNA lecture. And it was a three-hour deal, and I realized. I don't want to be stuck in a lab the rest of my life. I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So I just sat and finished the, that particular lecture. And then I walked over to advisement and I changed majors to creative writing and went and convinced three professors to let me into their class three weeks into the semester. Um, and they were. They said, they were, "What are you crazy? You're three weeks behind." I said, <laughs> "Yeah, but it's it's literature after 1950, and it's a poetry workshop, and it's another. I forget the other class, but I, I said, "I know I'm three weeks behind, but look at where I'm coming from. Come on, let me like <laughs> let me get at it." <clears throat> and they let me in, and I dropped a couple other classes, and I wound up wound up. I, I I I fell in love with literature and writing, um, beat poetry and um, Robert Lowell and uh, just there's there's so many writers that just I couldn't believe that in discussions around writing and stuff like that as long as I could back up what I felt the meaning of the text was by virtue of what's in the text, then I was correct. There's really, you can't argue with me because it's my perspective, right? As All opposed right. to empirical formulas and man, if that, the, those chemical reagents don't mix and make something yellow, then you've done something exceedingly wrong, right? Like it's, it, I mean, everything is so in the science world, it's so cut and dry. Um, it's not that way in literature and writing and 
I loved that <clears throat> that ebb and flow. So at any rate, I I loaded up on classes. I went full time all through the summer and applied to grad school <clears throat> right at the end of uh, that summer uh, semester, heading into fall, and got accepted to George Mason in Fairfax, Virginia. <clears throat> and yeah, I just then I so I I wound up finishing the entire degree in one year and went the next year uh, to George Mason. So. Well, that's awesome. And and speaking of writing, can you tell us a little bit about a film that you did? Um, can, you, can you go and, and tell us about it? And what we're going to do is we're going to put a link to the film, um, to the Vimeo film in the email and, and on all of our social media sites and in our show notes. But can you tell us a little bit about um, about your film and what what inspired that? Because I think it's really going to I think it's really going to sit well with a lot of our audience. Can you can you go into that a little bit, Matt? Sure. Um, so uh, let me see. It feels like everything begins back like in high school, but I'm not going to go away there. <laughs> it, 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 it. I think um, the it was in 2009 that I started writing the blog, Fishing Poet. And I had spent, uh, I was like maybe two and a half years. I was still working at an ad agency at the time and had already been th sort of through the ringer with finishing my master's. I don't have a communications degree. I don't have a journalism degree. I, you know, I, I didn't go to school to work in advertising, but I happened to land there and I wanted to teach and it just didn't, I wanted to teach at the collegiate level, but it just didn't, uh, didn't pan out. Um, that's the, the dirty little secret of MFA programs is especially in poetry. There's 3000 plus people that are graduating with a terminal degree and they're all going for the same junior college position in, you know, middle <laughs> Iowa because <laughs> yeah. it's the only one available. So, <laughs> so at any rate, I wound up falling into, into advertising and, um, had started out as an account exec in business development, not even on the creative side. Uh, nobody really gave much uh, credibility to poetry and its connection. They said, oh, just because you're a poet doesn't mean that you could write for marketing. Mm -hmm. So I, I wound up moving, moving through proving myself and getting uh, the writing position and then went to a different agency got another writing position but I was really really tired and and unhappy and was um I was really far away from what it is that I loved to do which is being outdoors and was also you know fly fishing and uh so I wound up in 2011 I pretty much had enough and I'd been writing the blog long enough and I'd built a bit of a, a bit of an audience and I've met a, a number of people at least virtually um, that are in the industry through the blog and so I went completely out on the limb and I left and I went independent as a freelance writer and one of the first things that I did um, well quick step back when I gave my notice two weeks later my friend Grant who's in the film he wound up getting let go from his job at a studio. He's a professional photographer, commercial photographer, and he got let go from the studio that he was at for 12 years. And so, and then my, I had given notice and I think in my time came up two weeks after him. And so now we're both out on our own and we had a couple of projects that we did. We worked on together, just, just trying to essentially get our name out there a little bit more. And then I went to um, IFTD uh fly tackle dealer association show down in um uh down in new orleans and wound up meeting all these industry people that i had only known virtually through social media mm. and it was fantastic and so i i got to shake hands put a face and a voice with a name and um you know introduce myself and stuff and uh i after I got back from that, 
Grant and I were, we had already planned to go out West for our first time. Um, my first time out, out West on a, you know, to go fish and stuff like that. And, um, Grant had never been out West either. So we said, well, you know, why not? Let's go check it out. So we went out and we met up with, uh, a few people again that I had known through social media. Uh, one of them, um, Rebecca Garlock, who used to write, um, she had the Outdoor Blogger Network and, um, and a couple others that I, I had reached out to her to get advice when I was starting my blog. And another one is Ross Slayton, who is just a, an amazing angler, recovering alcoholic and what have you. Uh, fly fishing, you know, he credits that as, as you know, saving his life. And um, and Colby Hackbarth, who is the owner of Cast Fishing Gear, and I had met him live at IFTD. And they just they they showed us their home waters, and we've we you know we became really good friends, and just had an amazing time. We spent ten days uh, between the Owyhee in Southeast Oregon. Uh, we fished Henry's Fork. We fished the South Fork of the Snake. Um, got up to the Salmon River, the Payette, you know, and just really got to poke around a lot. And I, I just, I fell in love with that part of the world. And when we were on our way back, on our way, way back, I told Grant, I said, there, we need to do something more than me just write a few blog posts and you sift through, you know, 10,500 images <laughs> and come up with a, a promo piece or a photo essay. I said, we got, we've got to do something more meaningful. And so I thought about it some more and I realized that um, there was a story there. I wanted to do a, I wanted to do a film because films were just starting to, they were just starting to come out and like low and clear. Um, they, that, that one had just come out and there's a small handful of others. And I was like, man, how cool would it be to, to do that. I mean, I had done broadcast work and advertising, but I wanted to wanted to do something where I could really tell a story and be able to do a work with somebody that could shoot it really well and you know be able to write it too. <clears throat> so um, we made plans. We connected with um, the guys from Rock House Motion uh, that fall. Wound up uh, when we planned to go back the same time the next year. And so we took a crew out. We spent 10 more days. We pretty much retraced our steps. And I, the story that, you know, that I wanted to get at was what's the, the one thing that the five of us and all of our disparate, you know, the, our disparate lives, we, we all had one major thing in common, aside from fly fishing, which, you know, is kind of the golden thread. But the big thing that we all had in common was that we had all chosen in some way, shape, or form to live our lives according to our passions and keeping what's important, you know, sort of at the head of the list. Um, you know, I, I said at one point, it, sometimes it's, it's, it's the decisions made for you. Sometimes you make the decision yourself. Um, but at the end of the day, it's what you, what you choose to do with that. Um, that really matters. So, um, so we we went back out that that next year. And we spent ten ten more days with the same cast of characters, and actually caught quite a few more fish on this time around than we did on the <laughs> first one, thankfully. Yeah. But but yeah, that 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 film that it was an it was an important an important story to me it was important because of the people that were in it um you know the the folks that i'd become friends with and it was important because the message wound up also really resonating with people a lot more than i could have ever imagined and i've met just i mean it's a, it's an unbelievably long list of people since then that 
you know, they'd seen the film or they gotten in touch with me. I'd become very close with people that, you know, they, they'll just send an email, you know, be out of the blue, you know, and wind up connecting with them somehow, getting a fish with them. And, you know, a bunch of them have made, made, they've become really close friends. So I think it's, it's, it's important, you know, when you, when you share, you open up and you share your vulnerabilities and you share your, you know, sort of the reasons why you do what you do. I think there's a lot more people, there's a lot more people out there that kind of just struggle and spin in circles in their own heads or um, just sort of in, in silence. And, and they don't, they don't think that there's anyone else that's going through what they're going through. And there, there, there's a lot more than just that one person for sure. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's important to help let people know that they're not alone, you know, and that there is no, there is no magic bullet. There's no one way, you know, to find happiness. I think we all, we all have it in us. It's just a matter of, I don't know, keep keeping the, the stuff that's important. Right. You know, keeping it up front, paying attention to that and everything else will, you know, the other stuff sort of takes care of itself. Is that kind of the, is, is that what you wanted to communicate through the movie? I think so. I think there's, there, no, 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 I, no, I know so. I, once we went on the trip and once we met everybody and, the more that we talked, the more I realized that there there is a bit of it's less serendipity and more science, I guess. Hmm. You know, and hmm. which it it kind of played into my you know my background. It's like this is almost like empirical evidence <laughs> that these folks they they paid attention to what makes them happy they paid attention to what's missing that mm. was there before mm-hmm. you know they added that element back into their life and took a step back from things that aren't filling their tank mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that equation that equation added up to happiness their own version of happiness you know right you know rebecca rebecca was a single mom a young single mom and she was just constantly she was in the sales job and was just working ridiculous hours and was just miserable and she was miserable and she found because she had grown up with an outdoor family and out spent all this time you know out fishing and time on the rivers and stuff and all that had gone away mm. and so she started to sort of get that back into her life and she started to realize you know, as did everybody it's a it's a universal it's when you when you take the time to take care of you right mm-hmm. to right. make sure that it's it's it you nobody can give 100 percent of the time nobody you know if you do that you're just gonna you're just gonna wither there is a level of you've gotta you've gotta make sure you attend to your own mental health and your own well-being and what have you because if you're not happy and you're not doing well you're not worth a darn to anybody else Mm. right you're not going to be you're not going to be there and be strong for your kids or for your spouse or you know your family and stuff so when you when you do pay attention to that and you are feeling better and more fulfilled then you start to get a better attitude about well work i actually have more energy for it and i'm having more fun playing with the kids because that's where i want to spend more time you know it's it that's the universal it doesn't necessarily have to be about fly fishing right it doesn't have to be well you got to find the job if you're employed and you're making a living and you know that that's fantastic you don't have to quit your job Mm-hmm. You don't have to, like I said, I said in the film, you don't have to, you know, this isn't about sticking it to the man. It's just, it's about finding the stuff that really, that fills you up and getting more of that in your life. Right. 
Yeah, definitely. I, you know, that's, that's a very good point. And, you know, we've had people deal with addictions that have come on the podcast and, you know, there's that saying, you know, to thine own self be true, you know, that they, that they went through with AA or whatever. And that's such a powerful statement because, you know, it's like you said, it's not about sticking it to the man because some people genuinely enjoy accounting. I would not be a good accountant, but some people are very good accountants. And, you know, it's, it's about doing what you feel like you need to do in life and what makes you happy. You know, and if that's being a plumber and taking over your dad's business, great. If that's being a fishing guide, great. But whatever it is, you know, um, you got to do that thing that you're going to be great at. And, you know, I teach my kids a lot about um, the seven habits, you know, the seven, ha- you know, Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. And mm-hmm. there's one of them that's the, the seventh habit is sharpen the saw. And that's all mm-hmm. about resting, taking a break sharpening your saw and going back at it, you know, and yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's easy to think about those other six habits. Oh man, you know, you, and a lot of them, you know, what, what I found is, is a lot of those habits, you are, are a lot of things in, um, in life and, and in business and, and all that, you know, you can quantify, those are the quantifiable things. You know, what's the ROI on, if I put this much marketing dollars, you being in, in advertising, right? So there's like an ROI on things. Like I, if I put this much in marketing, how much more revenue will this create, you know, create for my business and all exactly. this other stuff? You know what I mean? But when you go to sharpen the saw, it's not quantifiable. You know, it's right. It's it's that um, third dimension that's that's out there and and you feel better and you're doing better because you took that time, but you can't say for every hour I spend, I increase productivity by 0.02%. You know, you can't do that. Right. Yeah. The, the only, the only, the only way to quantify it is how good do you feel mm-hmm. after, you know, when you're done sharpening that saw, when you're done casting a fly or painting, you know, uh, a, a fantastic mural or what or, or singing or playing your guitar or doing i mean whatever it, it doesn't even necessarily need to be artistic it could be you could go run trails you could do you know any number of different things but how good do you feel about everything else mm-hmm. how much does your perspective change how much do you now things get you know things get lighter i mean that's about the only quantifiable and you're right you can't you can't even necessarily quantify that it's because it's a feeling it's right. not a it's poetry it's not a tangible it's poetry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. it's like oh, I, don't know. I just I remember i had this boss um or I, they call them team leaders but we all know what they are okay so <laughs> he, he mm-hmm. had this team leader and he would always tell me work harder jeff you need to whatever their motto was whatever you're doing do more just do more just do more, just do more. And then he'd tell me, go out there, sharpen the saw and get better and get better. He didn't know what sharpen the saw meant, you know, but he thought sharpen right. the saw means becomes a, become a better person, you know, become sharper. No, it's about like relaxing and chilling out, you know, but the dude was like, he just drove me to insanity to the point where I'm like, I've got to go get professional <laughs> help. And I did. And now I don't work in finance at all anymore, but that's, um, very, you know, again, it was in a fortune 500 company or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and it was one of these things where you're on, you're a number on a spreadsheet and you've done this much activity and produced this much results and this much and this much, and this much. And if you fall between these three metrics, then you're going to get fired any day. And so you're constantly living in this fear of like failing, not living in a mindset of hope for succeeding. And right, you know, and that's just not a healthy way to live. <laughs> Living in the gallows shadow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, it's interesting there, but you know what? There's a lot. There are a lot more folks out there that are wrestling with and trying to come to terms with whether or not they should they should you know get help or mm-hmm. whether they need someone to talk to or things like. I, there's i think there's there's just there's so many people that i think they they may not even necessarily whether they realize it or not or whether they want to admit it or not i think a lot of people are just they're, they're too they're too proud 
mm. in a lot of ways. But I mean, I I was diagnosed. Uh, I had been I had been fighting depression for uh, for decades, but I won't have, I, I was diagnosed at 39 years old with uh, full blown Tourette syndrome. Um, so I had I had tics you know, uh, physical and the, um, audible as well. And physical like the, with, with my hands and fingers or facial tics and things like that. But hold, hold on. Um, you were, you were 39 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I had, okay. I had, I, 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 I suffered through junior high. I had, I've had it my entire life, but I never knew what it was. I always knew there was something wrong. But I never knew what it was. And my mom, when I was growing up, she always thought it was a sugar allergy or an allergy to preservatives or things like that. Right. And so the diet at home always changed. And they said junior high is usually the toughest, the toughest period of where it starts to present the most. And that for me was, I mean, it was pretty textbook. It was miserable. But, um, but I had in um, my previous marriage, it had gotten, my tics had gotten to a point they because of stress and what have you I mean, that's all it goes right in line with starting the first job and advertising and really hitting hitting a wall not even the wall hitting like the bottom and feeling like i just i i shouldn't be on the planet and was i just had i had very little hope and as i i was on medication and stuff like that but then as a couple of years go by I wind up um, my ticks. She starts to notice that my ticks are ebbing and flowing along with different stress levels, and so we. I went to a a neurologist, and he literally he said, "All right, so come on in the room." He asked what what I've been seeing, what I've been going through, stuff like that, and then he sat me down on the table, and he literally he, he turned the lights out in the room, shined the light in my eyes, turned the lights back on. He says, you, you've got to be the oldest known undiagnosed case of like full-blown Tourette syndrome. He says, I, I know of no case histories of an, of an adult <laughs> your age that has never been diagnosed. Right. And, and it, it was one of those deals where, I mean, I just, I, I wept. I, I, because like, I knew that something had been wrong and I finally, I finally knew the devil that I was fighting. Right. Right. right it right. wasn't just depression. Depression's part of it. That's, see, that's the other thing, like with, with full blown Tourette's, uh, depression is part of it. Anxiety is part of it. Um, there's also, um, impulse control issues, there's the ticks and everything else um ocd is part of it so there's all like it's i mean this is a big this is a big bag of jelly beans here right and there's a whole lot of different flavors that's going on with this thing and it suddenly explained everything wow and it was such a relief and so we tried a bunch of different meds to combat it but he he said look the truth is you take something to make your ticks subside your depression will get worse you take something to fight depression your ticks will get worse or your ocd will kick up or this or do, you know nothing there's no there's nothing that helps across the board and so i said screw i'm you know what no i'm done no more meds i can't do it i tried a couple and it made me feel even worse and um so now i just I don't know. I it, like I said, it's the you know the devil you know is easier to deal with. So mm-hmm. I'm uh, I I I I try to focus on a little bit more you know it's diet, exercise, sort of the common sense stuff that that helps make life easier in general <laughs> for human for human <laughs> beings. Yeah, I I try to try to employ that a little bit more. So wow, well, that's excellent. Yeah, and. If if there's someone out there that that um that needs help, maybe they don't they don't want to reach out. You know, we just want to encourage them to do that and to to make that first step. And 
and to get help. And like you said, that, that we're not alone in, uh, that's one of the reasons we have the podcast is we're not alone. You know, we're all out there. We yep. all, we all have the different demons. We all have these different things that we deal with. So we really, um, we really appreciate you sharing your story with us, Matt. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. Well, cool. and absolutely. W- if, if someone want to get a hold of you or check out your blog or website, um, what, what would they do to, to find you, Matt? Uh, well, <laughs> because my, because the blog was so riddled with malware, <laughs> I wound up I wound up having to take down the I, I used I had a URL fishingpoet.com and now that's that's gone. So now it's it's a it's a WordPress site, so it's WordPress. Okay. Uh I think dot com forward slash fishing poet. If if I think if you if you were able to search it you'd or if you just you just search it, you'd you'd find it. It'd direct you there. Um and uh i also have i have my own professional site as well which is just matt at matt smite dot com uh and both of them have contact information i mean yeah i mean i i i uh i've, I've never been inundated with emails really <laughs> so i i happily i happily respond to people when you know people people reach out and I don't know. I like, I think at the end of the day, folks just want to know that there, there is other, there's other people out there that um, maybe do just need, they need an ear. And I think it's, it's good to be, to be that ear every now and again. So. Great. Well, great. Well, we'll put all those links up on our show notes and then also on our uh, podcast uh, website as well, remote, no com. And Matt, we just thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for taking some time to just to just hang out with us. Yeah, sure thing. It's been it's been fun. All right, have a great night. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Remote No Pressure podcast. Be sure to check out our website at remotenopressure.com. Also, sign up for our mailing list, and we also have a few of those sling packs available with Deli Fresh Design. Until next time, go fishing.